I am so grateful that you're all still in the room because I really feel like I should be singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game for the seventh inning stretch here. <laughs> you know, you're all like old friends and that's one of the reasons why it makes this event so fun. And you hear Colette talk about her husband as her partner, Pat talk about Katie as his partner, and Steve is my partner. And um, I know another couple, Ida and Harry, and they were going to sleep, and you know, Harry is tossing and turning and tossing and turning, and Ida finally says, Harry, why are you tossing and turning? And he says, oh, Ida, got a heavy heart. I owe Jaime Schlummerman a lot of money, and I can't pay it back. And she says, well, I can solve your problem. Runs downstairs, looks up Jaime's number, calls him. Jaime, Ida, why are you calling? Harry can't pay you back the money. Now you can't sleep all night. <laughs> right? So that's Harry and Ida. I don't know what goes on with Colette and her husband. I don't know what goes on with Pat and Katie, and that's a good thing, right? But I know what goes on in my household. So last night, I'm going to bed. Steve is like tossing and turning a little bit, and I'm really hoping he's not going to tell me the joke, you know, about Jaime Schlemmelman. Like, is there something I don't know, Steve? But he says, I've been reading about this hypersonic plane that they're testing in LA. And if you know Steve, he's all about the numbers, right? And so I'm trying to be like a level, loving, like good wife, right? And listening to this story. Like, oh, that's really interesting, they're developing this. It's 1.30 in the morning and he wants to talk about the plane. And he says to me, well, you know what that means, right? And this is a Steveism. Like he's always gonna give you the math. And I'm like, okay, what does it mean, Steve? And he says, it means that it goes five times at the rate of uh, light. And that if we were in LA, five times the speed of sound, sorry. Uh, if we were in LA, we could make it to New York in 20 minutes. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Do you want to nibble on my ear? Okay. And he kissed me and he said, good night. I was like, oh, thank you. But, so I hope that gives everything some levi levi levativity. <laughs> what a tremendous night it's been. And congratulations to Pat Fitzgerald and John DeVries and Colette, congratulations to you, you've done a fabulous job. Tonight, everyone here is seeing Roosevelt University's mission statement in action. This school was built and remains the cornerstone for social justice, building community, diversity, civic responsibility, and new leaders. Tonight, you're seeing the mission statement in person as all the parts of the equation come together. You would think that after all these years, it would be easy for me to give Steve an introduction. But it's really not, because you read about him in the newspaper almost all the time, and almost everybody knows him, and they know that he was the president of his class at the University of Chicago, and that he's built these relationships, and that he knows everybody in Young President's organization, and that he's changed the skyline and left a legacy. Crane's nickname Steve, the comeback kid in 1994, because after giving everything back to the bank, he came back to purchase a 900,000 square foot civic opera building and then went on to build the USG World Headquarters and Pepsi Headquarters in the West Loop. Then they kind of named him the King of the West Loop. In the middle of his career, he became a shapeshifter in developing 2,000 units on eight acres at K Station that include Left Bank, Echelon, Alta, and the illustrious K2. That led to the Lux Apartments, and then to Next Apartments, and then to the Sinclair Apartments in the Gold Coast. To come full circle, his friend Pat Fitzgerald calls him two years ago and says, hey, how about building the tallest building in the West Loop at 727 with me and David Friedman? And he said, you bet your ass I will. <laughs> but nobody's invincible. And that was a great call, but sometimes you get knocked down. In fact, life just slaps you in the face. 
But true leaders like Pat and Steve and Colette, they get up and they do it again and again and again. You've heard Pat making it through five different cycles. When I look at Steve Fifield, what I see is a boy with twinkles in his eyes. If you ask him what he wants to eat most of the time, he'll tell you it's chocolate. And after a day of work, he wants to go home and devour a book like a good student, or analyze something, or see Hamilton, or attend an art show, or go to the movies. He has fabulous energy. Feed me, take me, show me, teach me. And it's that childlike wonder and curiosity that has made him a visionary leader. But what keeps Steve relevant isn't the fact that he keeps building in cycle after cycle after cycle. It's the fact that he shares his vulnerability as a man and as a leader in telling his story. The road was not linear. It wasn't a straight line to success and greatness. It had twists and turns, and it's been a roller coaster that has made our journey such a fabulous adventure. If you know Steve well, you know that he loves his iPhone. And so for this, Steve, this is the introduction that I really wanted to give you. Come on up. It's my pleasure to introduce Steve Byfield. Thank you, Randy, for being the best partner and mate any guy could have. Thank you, Colette and Roosevelt University for the, the opportunity to share some of my lessons. But tonight I'm talking about the two elements that transform your talent into success. And this is particularly true of you younger people in the room, whether it's a young banker like Audrey Filippiak from CIBC, some of you students who are completing your MBAs, uh, and it might even be applicable to some of you people who are over 30. There are two, I think, key elements uh, for being either an employee on the rise uh, or an entrepreneur. And that's finding mentors, mentors and having a strategy that evolves. That is why finding mentors, being a mentor, and evolving your own personal strategy to fit your talent and the opportunities that you see in front of you, most of which we miss, uh, are key. And I'm going to share some of the secrets that I and several well-known execs in Chicago and elsewhere that have been keys to our successes. One of them I'll acknowledge that's not even in my speech here is Rick Bloom, because when Colette was talking about the successful 550 West Washington building, <clears throat> Rick was my right-hand man at the time, and he's the one who actually talked me into pursuing that deal. The seller was a total jerk, and I didn't even want to deal with the guy, and he said, I'll do it and we made it happen. About strategy, let me say that I learned in grad school, that one further south of here, uh, that our careers have three stages. Technical, where you learn your basic skills, whether it's going to architecture school, getting bank training as a credit officer, financial analysis, construction management, it's irrelevant, but you gotta master the technical skills. Your next stage of development as a rising person, and, and not just the business community, you can be an artist, uh, an architect, uh, an actor, uh, is managerial skills. How do you motivate people? And then finally, strategic, the most important, which is to go where the market is going and not where it's been. And Pat, you alluded to that. You know, you don't rest on your laurels with your last building. Uh, you've got to figure out what's going to sell three years from now, not what's sold that you spec'd two years before. That three levels and the strategic focus has been my mantra, not only for my career, but for my personal life. If you don't have a strategy for your life and your career, you'll bounce around with no purpose, nor attain any satisfaction. 
Randy and I not only make goals for our business, but for our personal lives together and with our seven children, one of whom is ever at Kirkland and Ellis, just graduated Mount Holyoke a year ago, wants to go to law school, and she's figured it out already. You gotta have a strategy in how you're gonna get there. And we check those bucket lists regularly. Randy and I will lay in bed at night and she'll whip out a page and she'll say, look at this, this is our goal list from five years ago. Can you believe we accomplished all but one of these things? And it's like, yeah, if you've got a list, it tends to get done. After getting my MBA, I went to work as an analyst for the group that built Water Tower Place. I got to start kind of at the top, I was lucky. I didn't have a clue whether I'd amount to anything. I was just this fresh MBA who was good at math and financial analysis. But I had an itch I couldn't scratch. And as I was commuting from the north side on the um, 151 uh, Michigan Avenue bus, a friend had given me a book called Real Estate Syndication Digest, 1972. Still relevant today. And <laughs> that book talked about how to syndicate money and structure deals for acquisitions or new construction development. The week I finished the book, I went into Tom Klutznick's office at Urban Investment and quit. He was really pissed off because I was supposed to be his protege. Uh, and then I went around and I followed a couple brokers around the north side looking for deals. Of course, they couldn't find many. Too many guys from the Lincoln Park Builders Club always seemed to, to land them. Uh, and uh, I went out of town, other, other areas to look. At the same time, I knocked on law firm and accounting firm doors looking for wealthy investors to invest, to invest with me. That was a time when the tax laws were very favorable for real estate and there was more money coming in from wealthy entrepreneurs. And there were certain law firms and accounting firms that had lots of rich clients, didn't know what to do with all their cash. And my job was to help them invest it with me. I borrowed money from my dad for the first earnest money deposit and had 60 days to raise the equity and close on the deal or I would have lost the money. He, by the way, put a mortgage on a small farm in Indiana to lend me the money. So I had a little bit of pressure on me. During that time, I bought a shopping center whose anchor tenant went bankrupt about 60 days after I bought it. Uh, a little company called Goldblatt's. Uh, a couple of apartment buildings. And a couple years later, partnered with Chuck Palmer to form Fifield Palmer to do the same thing, except this comes back to strategy. An office boom had started in the suburbs. And he and I, he had already had an experience as an office leasing broker with then the largest commercial firm in Chicago called Arthur Rubloff. In a couple of years, he and I put together a couple million square feet of office buildings in the suburbs. Wally Smith, you'll be, <laughs> you'll uh, kind of like to know that that was when insurance companies put all the equity up and split the profits with us 50-50. <clears throat> Boy, those were the days. <laughs> Almost too easy. Uh, and we both saw this huge migration of people and jobs to the suburbs, and we embraced the strategy. We dove in. Chuck, by the way, was my mentor. He was 13 years older than me. And he taught me much about leasing, design, excuse me, design, construction, and managing people. Some of those other pieces that I needed to know to hit the first two things on that three, you know, uh, level list, technical, managing people. I was just this kind of math whiz who would crank out projections uh, <clears throat> and make pretty good presentations to the banks. I don't know, Audrey, do I still do a decent job? Actually, she'll say no because somebody else does it for me now, who's a lot smarter than me. That's another lesson, by the way. Surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. I went on my own five years later and started and then built another four million square feet of offices, both in the suburbs and then came downtown and had half of them under construction when the Great Recession started, uh, one of the worst downturns uh, that's ever happened in real estate. It was 17 banks, 
defaulted on $800 million worth of debt. Um, my employees and I thought we were on our way to making our first $100 million. What saved me was another mentor, Norm Bobbins, uh, who's now, I think, Chairman Emeritus of CIBC. I knew him as the president of Exchange Bank and then later the chairman of LaSalle Bank. He told me with integrity and tenacity to work on it, and that's what I did. And he gave me tips on how to work with the banks. And I uh, began to realize that not every bank works the same way uh, and uh, developed a strategy to, to keep from being pushed into to bankruptcy. Uh, one of my protégés, Bob Smetana, and I worked to finish all the projects under construction, which we did. We leased them all up and we sold them and helped the banks get as much of their money back as they could. Um, I didn't collect a dime other than the banks paying us fees to pay the salaries of our employees. Um, that experience really focused me. Focused me more about strategies and what to do, how to structure your capital to be less vulnerable, which is why a lot of us do joint ventures with institutions, because after all, we're supposed to be the talent executing, not the actual money partners. Um, and uh, although sometimes we do have to write checks. Um, and how to stay alert when the market is moving. And I'll give you some insights tonight that I think might be very useful for you, because we spend a lot of time thinking about this. We like to follow the data. After years of cajoling me as just the office guy, uh, Randy, talk, and who had renovated, well, she's now, I think, up to 29 homes in 25 years, uh, buying apartment buildings to rehab or convert to condos, she talked me into joining her to do our first residential project, which we did in 1999 with an old uh, industrial loft building was vacant uh, that we converted into 190 unit Gotham lofts condos at Van, Kier Van Buren and Clinton, which my office overlooks today, uh, which by the way is in a building that Jerry Nudo had bought and then sold to another guy and we bought it. All this stuff all overlaps, it's all interconnected. I didn't like that rehab very much though, so we went to a couple other buddies, Charlie and Harry Huzanis, Mike Lerner and Bernie Levitin, and we partnered up on the other buildings in the next block that we had bought and said, Lerner, you take care of the rehab, let's all be partners. And between the two, we ended up doing, I think, 460 uh, condos right at a time when loft condos were really taking off. And I remember Randy and I talking, and I said, I like new construction, why couldn't we build them? The numbers didn't pencil. But loft condos penciled, and then later loft apartments, uh, like the ones that Annie Properties and others did in the West Loop. Our selling brokers on Gotham Lofts did so well on the sellout that they took their commissions and started their own company. <laughs> they were not our employees, they were third party. But you probably know that company, it's called At Properties. And the founders are Thad Wong and Michael Golden. It is a small world indeed. That led, of course, to another kind of venture that I just mentioned, uh, and from there, the group of us got along so well, it's good to be a nice guy when you're partners with people and to treat them fairly. <clears throat> we all, I got a call from um, Tom Korfman, who at the time was with Cranes. He said, hey, are you bidding on this eight acres that the Chicago Milwaukee Road is selling? Um, <clears throat> that's been uh, rezoned for a couple thousand apartment units. I said, I hadn't even heard of the deal. So I have to give publicly acknowledgement to Tom Korfman, who I think is at Tribune now, uh, that he was my tip for that deal. Tom, I'm sorry, you're not a registered broker. I do not owe you a commission. Um, <laughs> but what he also told me was that he thought Charlie and Harry were bidding on it, but they were backing out because they thought the deal was too big. And it, and it was, relatively speaking, I mean, for, for just a piece of land. Uh, and that some private equity fund was going to buy it and just sit on it for a couple years and flip it. So I called Charlie and Harry and I said, hey, I hear you're looking at uh, the uh, Kinsey Street property. Um, let's buy it together and I'll split it with you. And we bought it together. Uh, the then LaSalle Bank uh, financed the, um, uh, the land acquisition and we all scrambled up the, the cash 
And uh, thank God we have Bernie Levinton in the partnership. He was kind of our biggest investor. Uh, but a couple years into it, the guys were saying, hey, we don't really want to do apartment buildings. Uh, we want to stay in the condo area. And I got Pacific Life Insurance to, uh, to partner up with me, and we bought out that group, and we ended up owning all the property ourselves. Now, why were we chasing it? This is where watching what's going on in the market is relevant. People stopped building apartment high-rises in Chicago 20 years prior to 2000, I think we bought it in 2003, 2004, because the assessor had changed the taxation requirements that all apartment buildings over six units would be taxed as if they were commercial buildings. And that increased taxes to 40% of market value instead of 16% like other residential. They unwound that. And some of us realize apartments would become uh, viable again. So we jumped on the deal. We made the deal with PAC Life and ended up building 2,145 units in five towers, uh, actually with three different partners. Our first building was actually done with Prudential in their, I think, Presa 2 fund, and, uh, which Prudential still owns. Um, we actually got an offer and they said, we'll match it and we'll buy you guys out. We want to keep holding it and they still have it. It's a cash cow for them, which is good. Uh, and then we did the other buildings uh, with two other institutional partners, uh, Pac Life and then CB Global. Um, but there are storm clouds on our horizon today. Last year, the city raised apartment real estate taxes over $1,000 a unit. While the city council this month passed the pilot affordable program that is so onerous that yields on the development costs have fallen 20% uh, into the not feasible range for sites in the West Loop River North and the Milwaukee Road corridor that are subject to it, which are sites that are being upzoned for higher density. And I feel sorry for Sterling Bay, Riverside, and others that thought they were, they'd add residential to their mixed use projects in those markets uh, because the residential portions are not feasible now. Luckily, the program only has a three-year life, and as some of us were discussing tonight, I think we'll just be waiting for three years so we can come back and build in those markets. I don't think that's what the city was hoping for, but they didn't talk to us. Well, they did. They just didn't pay attention to us that this would hurt the, uh, the finances. That's why it's so important to constantly review your strategy and shift with changing circumstances. Best yet are the entrepreneurs who've switched gears. What do all these guys have in common other than an itch? They recognized a change and an opportunity. They dove in with both feet. All of them had mentors who helped and guided them. Sam Zell's law school graduate, uh, classmate, and equal partner, Bob Lurie, was one of the brightest and forward-thinking guys I ever knew. I'll never forget riding the train with him one day from Winnetka. And he said, you know, rail cars are like real estate companies. Uh, people will sign long-term leases. You can finance those leases and get a great return on your equity. Then he and Sam went out and bought over a billion dollars in tank cars and made it a business. And then they started buying mobile home parks, same concept, and that's now a major public read. All these guys have worked their butts off to execute well with very talented people around them who they rewarded well as well. And when they stumbled, they were stubborn enough to get up and try something new. So how does this apply to you? This isn't just about starting companies. It isn't about just being a real estate developer. This is about career strategies. You've got to look for mentors, and you just have to ask. And you've got to think strategically and see how it applies to you, whether you're a carpenter who wants to be a foreman, an analyst who wants to, uh, to uh, you know, be a loan officer, an apartment leasing agent who wants to be a property manager, um, even a college grad looking for a job. Find a mentor or two, as well as step back and look at the big picture. And part of that big picture, and I'll leave you with, are the trends. So here are my observations about where things are today. From 17 to 19, 2017 to 2019, we're adding 12,000 units downtown. 
Will we start as many projects in the next three years as developers as we started in the last three years? I think you all know the answer to that. Every billion dollars of internet sales reduces real estate um, demand for retail space by a million square feet and increases warehouse space demand by two million feet. 10,000 people turn 65 every day. Most of them are tired of mowing their lawn. Universities have added more student housing in the last 10 years than the previous 50 years. More millennials are living at home than previous generations and their parents are getting sick of it. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, medical services are growing fast and will continue to for decades to come. In fact, I wonder if shopping centers will become medical facilities. Uh, office employers have shrunk space per uh, employee from 300 feet to 150 square feet per employee. Um, I built my last of six million square feet of office buildings 10 years ago. Uh, I don't think Chicago's actually needed that much new office space because everybody's contracting within their space. Luckily, it's finally caught up with this, which Rick Bloom is very grateful for. Um, conversely, how much longer will employees stand to work at benches with no privacy in these open office environments? The United States has become a manager of most of the world's wealth. That's one of the reasons why the best job opportunities seem to be working for investment advisors, private equity funds, and the like. The internet provides more info and services than we could ever imagine. What are we going to do with all those empty garages, thanks to Lyft and Uber? What are we gonna do with these half vacant second, secondary location shopping centers? Will Airbnb gather more rooms to rent worldwide than Marriott currently manages. What's your strategy for the next two to five years? If you're looking for a job, think about what company you want to go work for. Are they big in what used to be hot that's headed the wrong direction? Or are they in an area that you know is going to have growth and opportunity for you? What's new for others? One example, Sam Zell and David Helfan have accumulated $2 billion in cash in their equity commonwealth office REIT. Are they waiting for a buying opportunity? Do they know something we don't know? We will fail or succeed based upon our ability to read and interpret the data that's already in front of us. It's an exciting time to be alive and chasing our dreams. It's also a little scary to figure out where things are headed.